Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. Record highs were once again recorded on Wall Street. The U.S. GDP is rising faster than many expected, and Canada also had surprising growth, though at a much smaller pace. And while commodities are booming, they have not helped raise the Canadian dollar much. Martin Armstrong, founder of armstrongeconomics.com, joins us from Florida. He's worried the U.S. economy could rapidly head into negative territory in a couple of months. He believes U.S. neocons will push us into deadly conflicts, creating stagflation. WolfStreet.com publisher Wolf Richter gives us the latest trends in U.S. home buying, interest rates, Canada's housing bubble, the auto market, and whether the Fed will lower interest rates this year. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from Recyclico Director of Marketing, Tony Mitchell. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY on the OTCQB AMYZF and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclico.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on X at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show. Good to be with you, Jim. How would you describe the action on the stock markets this week? Well, you know, this is a pre-holiday stretch. Here we are uh, going into a long weekend, and, uh, you know, the classic is that uh, you're going to be strong into it. Uh, you know, Fosbach wrote a book back in the 70s talking about how, uh, you know, the, the specialists on the New York Exchange like to uh, run things up into weekends and especially into long weekends, make people feel good so the specialists can sell into these guys on Monday morning when they come back. But uh, the fact is that, uh, you know, what you've got here is a rising trend. You've got, um, you know, consumer sentiment now at two-and-a-half-year highs, and some of that, I think, is a reflection of what's going on in the market. Um, GDP numbers, uh, if you can believe them, 3.4% in the U.S., good number there. Mortgage rates uh, actually taking a downtick. So uh, you got a lot of good stuff out there, and um, you got a market that is going through these, you know, three- to five-day consolidations and then moving to new highs, and that's what we've had this week. Uh, started off the week reasonably well, paused the middle of it, and, you know, closing off the week at all-time highs in just about every one of the indices. So uh, people are happy, uh, but what you have to keep a watch for is that as the these things stare, step up, and it's been, you know, how many, uh, forget about weeks, it's how many months now, uh, you know, it was uh, October the 30th that we bought them, and here we are coming into the end of the calendar quarter in March. So uh, each one of the small pullbacks now has been holding at a previous high. So these stair-stepping moves, um, you get a chance to keep a very close eye on them. Uh, the midweek low that we had this week in the S&P, I think you want to be looking at that as a uh, key support level for the uh, for the short-term traders. Um, on the credit side of things, the, CC, the uh, uh, Fed's CCC spread, um, which uh, we keep a close eye on, that's starting to see some excesses. And uh, if we get a reversal in there, uh, then uh, I'd expect to see the uh, S&P pull back to... Uh, it's a uh, uh, 20-week moving average, which could give us a pretty decent correction in here. So trends up, but be cautious, have your stops in, and uh, enjoy the ride while you can. Even Canadian GDP stronger than expected. Yeah, um, you know, but it didn't do much for the Canadian dollar. Uh, you've got uh, the Canadian dollar closing off the week around just 
just under 74, 73.80. It's been three or four weeks stretch here of just going sideways. And if you look at the differential and in interest rates between Canada and the U.S., uh, we're at about 0.86% on the five-year uh, rates when you compare a U.S. to Canadian. So there's no strong bias in there uh, that would uh, push Canadian dollar up or down. On the other side of the coin, the uh, action that we've seen in the oil market and in commodities in general has been so bullish right now um, that uh, the, the fact that the Canadian dollar is not doing well, as we mentioned a week ago, um, this just you know continues to put an overhang as far as the, uh, the dollar is concerned because as a commodity currency, you'd like to see it do better here. And, uh, and I think... Uh, you know, taking a look at just even outside of the agricultural side of the equation, the copper market, uh, you know, we were at 370 ish uh, a month ago, rallied to four and a quarter. Well, now we're sitting at $4. This is still um, sort of a breakout of a base and in a nice uptrend. So, you know, base metals, agricultural commodities, oil market, all should be helping out the Canadian dollar a lot more than it's been doing so far. What's going on with gold? Uh, gold, like all the other commodities, when I look at the commodity page, basically, other than cocoa, which had been just screaming on the upside, it's a green page. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at, uh, um, say, uh, precious metals, base metals, uh, grains, cotton, cocoa, sugar, all the items that we look at there. It's green, and effectively, um, that's been with a uh, decent week on the upside in the U.S. dollar index. So these commodities are doing pretty darn well. And the gold market, uh, new all-time highs uh, as of this week, just slowly, slowly working its way here up. Um, but, uh, you know, it doesn't have a lot of momentum. Um, we got exhaustion highs, big overbots uh, about 10, 12 days ago. Um, had a pause. Uh, we thought we might get back under 230 or 2130. That has not happened. Um, so we're at 2220 to close off the week on the spot price. Um, we've got targets uh, in terms of the next run that are up into the mid 2300 range. And uh, this thing's got the potential to do that. And if we take a look at the other uh, precious metals, uh, silver's now got sort of a quadruple top here with resistance in the $25.50 to $26 range. If it can pop outside of that, there's some pretty big uh, upside targets. Uh, and it's because we've spent so much time consolidating, by the time you get out of here, there should be a fair amount of uh, cons just uh, buying sitting on the sidelines uh, ready to step in. And we know what the silver market can be like once uh, once the buyers get a hold of it. Uh, it's uh, been pretty exciting, not not just in, you know in the last couple of years, but over the last forty or fifty years, uh, this market has got lots of potential once it gets going. And on the financial crime front, we have Sam Bankman Fried sentenced to twenty five years for the FTX cryptocurrency fraud that cost people. Billions of dollars. Yeah, and they get back pennies on the dollar. It's just not fair uh, what these people can get away with. Uh, just, uh, you know, 25 years. Well, I guess that's one thing. But if I was one of the creditors on the, the other side of the equation, I'd be pretty upset at this point. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Pleasure to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Find him on X at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Martin Armstrong, next on This Week in Money. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com.
My guest is Martin Armstrong, founder of Armstrong Economics, available online at armstrongeconomics.com. He's speaking to us from Florida. Marty, welcome back to This Week in Money. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. In May, you'll be hosting the London Economic Confidence Model Seminar. Can you tell us about it, and where can people get tickets? Uh, Well, they can get tickets on our site. Um, I'm not sure how many are still left, but um, because London tends to be a smaller venue than what we can do in, in like, Orlando, for example. But... uh, uh, yeah, basically, I mean, I used to live in London, so, you know, I thought we would do one in London for a change rather than, you know, Frankfurt or Berlin or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, we have the economic confidence model turning May 7th, and this just looks to be a, an extremely important turning point. Uh, we're probably heading into a recession in from Finally, after May, going into maybe about 2028, and you got war cycles coming. It's just a real mess, really. And uh, so people sign up on your website. Can you? Uh, uh, yeah. You have a report out called the 2024 Outlook, the year from political hell. What the hell is that about? <laughs> and where can people get that up report? Uh, well, they can, you know, go to our site for that. But, I mean, people don't realize, I mean, we we focus on the elections here, um, like in, in 20, you know, this, at the end of the year for the U.S., but 60% of the world is going through elections. Um, I mean, the head of the EU is up for election. I mean, everywhere you go, it's, um, I mean, Russia just, you know, elected uh <clears throat> Uh, Putin. I mean, everywhere you go, you you had major election in in Taiwan. Um, it, it's it's people are getting very frustrated pretty much everywhere, uh, and uh, it's it's the you know the economic conditions that have been so deplorable. Uh, <clears throat> you know the uh, the COVID nonsense that they pulled off. I mean, so many companies are you know, are just gone. Um, a lot of the, you know, the vacancies in, in office buildings is still high. Uh, I mean, the whole objective for, was really uh, the climate change people. They wanted to end commuting. And so, you know, you have a lot of people now just working from home. Do you have any 2024 Outlook updates? Well, it... Um, it certainly appears what what's going on. I've been warning about uh, for a couple of years now that they would be moving to try to create war before the election uh, here in the states, mainly because um, you know Biden is basically what I call their hand puppet. You know, he's not there forty percent of the time, and and people have to understand how government really functions uh, you know you have these cabinet meetings and the president is supposed to be the referee and so we have the state department in the hands of the neocons you have environmental in in the hands of climate change people and then you have the treasury yelling at both of them what are you doing um and everybody's just doing their own thing so there's nothing that's really coordinated um, I mean, an example, you got the neocons, you know, threatening China over Taiwan when China is the largest buyer of U.S. national debt and it started selling. And then, like, the Treasury, Yellen has to hop on a plane and go over there and say, please keep buying. What do you do? I mean, you, you can't threaten China and then at the same time say, please buy another, you know, a few billion dollars worth of our bonds so that we can buy some bullets to shoot you, you know? Uh, there's just no coordination. Nobody seems to be really in charge, and that's the real problem with Biden, that he's literally not there. He's in Delaware 40% of the time. Your economic confidence model turns down after May 7th to 8th, also known as 2024.35. Any thoughts on what this could be signaling? Um, it certainly appears that... Um, well, we're heading into an ec- an economic type decline, 
But inflation is going to continue upward because this is part of the war cycle. So you really end up in a stagflation type thing like the late 1970s. Uh, And our computer on geopolitical uh, concerns, the two targets this year were uh, May, which is the strongest one, and then July, August. And um, so even this attack in Russia has got, you know, a lot of people now very, very concerned. The price of lithium looks like it might have put in a bottom. More and more gigafactories and even terafactories are being planned all over the world. Are you bullish on lithium and the battery metals for 2024? Um, look, they had a very strong rally for two years, but they fell back dramatically. Um, the sales of, of these EVs have declined. People really don't want them. Uh, and I know, you know, they keep pushing, oh, this is going to be fantastic, whatever, but it's just not. And um, <clears throat> even when we look at crude oil, uh, it, it it still looks like it's going higher and you're not looking at a eventual peak until probably about 2029. Uh, you, you can't get, honestly, um, you can't get rid of, of fossil fuels. Uh, I mean, you're, this is, I mean, Germany's going, you know, it's, it's economic decline has started because a lot of factories have, uh, can't get even, uh, fuel anymore. Um, you can't switch everything to electric. And, you know, the wind and, and solar is very nice, but, uh, it's not going to replace the entire power grid. It's just simply not. Well, I'm thinking of so many things that use uh, oil. For example, just paving a road, that's heavy oil. How's electricity yeah. going to replace that? It, it, you get these, honestly, for our, um, I, you know, I don't I don't even know where they, they come up with this stuff. But in analysis, what the mis- giant mistake these climate people are doing is, oh, it went up a half a degree this year. Oh, it went up a quarter of a degree. Late. Okay, so let's extrapolate that. It's always going to go up now, and in, a, in 20 years, we're all going to be dead. It doesn't work that way. That's like saying, oh, well, the Dow went up, you know, 500 points last month, so it's going to do that forever. I mean, <laughs> there are cycles in these things, okay? and But all of the analysis, I mean... You can go online and see they were calling for an ice age in the 70s. And when they got that wrong, they switched it to, to global warming. And, you know, we're all, we're all supposed to have, you know, honestly be dead by now. And, um, I think it was even, they said Miami would be underwater by 2014. It's not. Um, we didn't go into an ice age. They said the ice caps are all going to be gone by 2020. Uh, sorry, they're still there. You know, it's I, you know you just can't do analysis in that fashion. Just because it goes up to three degrees three years in a row doesn't mean it, it just keeps going forever. Well, and someone said uh, one of the dangers with AI, if we can for a second. You tell AI, okay, solve world hunger. How do we know the computers aren't going to decide that to solve world hunger, they should get rid of three or four billion of us? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, most of that is, <clears throat> I would say, Hollywood movie stuff. I mean, I've been, you know, one of the leaders in, in programming AI. Uh, we have our own com- AI system with a 40-year track record. It... it you you can't possibly uh, create, I would say, personality or something of that nature. This theory about AI, uh, it, it started with these people that, one, they don't believe in God or anything. They think our brain is just a supercomputer, and consciousness is a mere factor that you throw all this data in, and it suddenly becomes alive. And so that's been the theories of uh, behind the Hollywood movies, etc. cetera. Um, great sales movies, but it's not practical. Um, I mean, like I say, I've been programming for a long time. I was even a keynote speaker at um, American Hackers <laughs> Convention. Uh, it, it's 
um, you can't do that, and it's not going to be able to make such a decision. And a lot of these people are calling AI. Uh, you take this chat uh, program. It's a it's a uh, it's a search program. You ask it, gee, what's uh, you know uh, somebody's dog's name? It it has access to the internet. Goes back and says who it is. That's it. All right. It's not original thought. Uh, IBM created Big Blue and beat a, you know everybody on Jeopardy, and they said this is going to cure cancer. Failed. It, it cannot come up with something <clears throat> that it can't look up. So it's incapable of actual original thought. Um, our computer basically <clears throat> monitors the entire world. It does fantastic job in forecasting from a cyclical perspective. I taught how it, you know, how that would work. Um, you, it didn't just do this on its own. I mean, it, it, it's, and it's not going to tell you, um, about anything other than what it has in its database. You know, it's not going to tell me, you know, what, uh, Lady Gaga's dog's name is. It, it's just not, you know, it's not going to do that. Um, <clears throat> But, I mean, AI, I wouldn't worry about it, you know, killing everybody or something like that. I would be more concerned about the climate change people who are in bed with the, the neocons. And they do want to reduce the world population by 50%. And that's why that you see all these leaders almost really cheering World War Three. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. I mean, all the time I grew up, you were working for a world peace. Nixon went to separate, you know, open China and divide them from, from Russia. And today we put them together. I mean, it, I, I really don't understand it, but it looks like they legitimately do want to create World War Three so they can save the planet, reduce CO2. Doesn't all that radiation kind of ruin that if you go to World <laughs> War Three? Actually, no. no. Uh, you can look at, hot, you know, um, in Japan, those cities came back really good. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, it baffled everybody where Chernobyl went up, and everybody left, oh, you'll never be able to go there again. And these guys went there in in hazmat suits, and they saw mice running around all over the place. They said they should be dead. They took them, and they they it turned out to be... It's it's a refuge for wildlife, and the mice r- reproduce very rapidly, and they're immune to radiation. Um, you can you know look at these studies. I mean, it's it's very interesting what they thought would uh, destroy the world. It turns out it doesn't. The Dow is hovering around the forty thousand point mark. Does Socrates see a Dow hitting fifty thousand points ahead and or a bull market into twenty twenty five? Yes, the Dow I know is is up pretty high. I mean, this was our first target, and I put that out about probably about ten years ago. Everybody thought it was nuts, um, but uh, we're still going higher. By the probably around twenty thirty two, you're looking at around sixty five thousand. Um, and what you have to understand is that the pay attention to the Dow, the S and P, and the Nasdaq. And you'll see that the Dow has led the way up. Why? Because that's where the big money goes, international money. And the more you start beating the war drums in Europe and Asia, major institutions, they start realizing, hey, you know, maybe we should diversify a little bit and been sending money to the, uh, the United States for the last, you know, three years aggressively. Uh, and... Major institutions, they they buy the big AAA stuff. I mean, they don't buy the NASDAQ startups things. I mean, if they lose money, the guy loses the job. So as long as he invests in all the, the you know, the big blue stuff, um, fine. If he lost money, everybody lost money, and he doesn't lose his job. But if he sticks his neck out and buys some company that um, everybody feels it is a big risk and he loses money, he, lo- he loses his job. So <clears throat> the Dow is moving up, and, and 
Like I, I've said before, the U.S. was virtually bankrupt in 1896. That's when J.P. Morgan had to lend 100 million gold to bail it out and everything. Uh, after World War I, New York became the financial capital, displaced London. After World War II, U.S. had 76% of the world official gold reserves. And that's why the dollar became the reserve currency at Bretton Woods, etc. All right. That money came here because Europe was blowing itself apart. So if you start getting wars again over in Europe, as a lot of these European leaders seem to be beating the drums, that money's coming to North America. Um, you don't keep your money there in a bank when tanks are running down the street blowing things up. Does Socrates see the bond market signaling higher interest rates ahead? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> it, it Keep in mind that there's a difference between long-term and short-term. The central bank can, short, you know, can set the short-term. They cannot do the long-term. That is why they got involved in quantitative easing, which was buying in long-term debt. That's how they were trying to reduce the long-term interest rate, because that is set by the marketplace. All right. Now, as you enter war, all right, <clears throat> you got to be crazy to buy a 10 year bond. You know, why would you do that? Interest rates rise during wars. Plus, you don't know who's going to win. All right. You can go to eBay and buy plenty of bonds from different countries that are defaulted. All right. <clears throat> and then, you know, even Yellen had to jump on a plane and go off to China to try and convince them to keep buying. All right. It's, it's, serious situation here. I mean, you can't have, um, like I said, you can't have these neocons trying to start war on absolutely every front and then interest rates going down. It's just not going to happen. Does Socrates see the April 8th eclipse coinciding with anything? Um, going into it, May, yes. I mean, it's uh, whether it's coincidence or not, it's hard to say. I mean, from ancient cultures, uh, solar eclipses were always seen as like a, an apop apocalyptic type prophecy. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's it's interesting that it's showing up at the same time when we're looking at, you know, threats of war and things of this nature going on. Um, but <clears throat> as far as the ancients were concerned, it was usually meant a bad omen. Gold broke through $2,200 an ounce, but the gold stocks don't seem to care what's going on. Um, you really have to understand that gold is neutral, all right? Um, and <clears throat> so a lot of these people are saying, oh, bricks, and they're going to go back. No, they're not. I mean, that's not the issue. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of central banks have been buying gold only because they – the neocons have turned the dollar into a weapon. When they went after, you know, Russia and took them out of SWIFT, that was a warning sign to everybody else. Hey, if you don't do what we tell you to do, we'll take you out of SWIFT. And so that's what the BRICS is really about. It's not um, the end of the dollar per se, as people or you know like to say, but... <clears throat> because the U.S. is the biggest economy because it is a consumer-based economy. That means everybody needs to sell their stuff here, from the BMWs, the Toyotas, or the EVs coming in from China. Um, it, it's, this is the consumer market. This is what China is now trying to move desperately to r replicate on their side. And when they do that, you know, China will then displace the United States. But, um, you know, as opposed to Germany, uh, Germany never left the old mercantile um, model. Keep taxes very high, etc., so that um, they were more concerned about inflation. So, I mean, you can look at it, the average German has let, less net worth than an Italian. So their mercantile model is we don't sell to ourselves, we sell to everybody else. Um, so that that's the real problem why uh, Germany, you know, find it's the strongest economy in Europe because the rest of them are all, 
you know, really leftist uh, Marxist lovers, but um, it could never, uh, you know, compete with the United States, Japan, or China. How important is it to follow the commitment of traders' reports for gold? Um, maybe 50 50, because um, not everybody's really in there. Like I said, a lot of, you know, they've been, central banks have been buying gold mainly because the dollar has become political. And if the neocons are going to use it as a weapon, then basically they're trying to exit from that. Um, but they're also exiting from the EU and euros, etc. Uh, so it's more or less that, you know, the West has is, is become very aggressive uh, in its geopolitics. And when you do that, basically you don't buy the debt of your enemy. Is copper the commodity to watch? Um, yes. I mean, in in times of war, uh, copper basically goes up. Um, I mean, even in, if you look in uh, <clears throat> at World War II, in 1943, they replaced copper pennies with steel. Um, so copper... <clears throat> looks like it's probably going up and its major high is not going to be until around 2029, 20, 2030. Home sales are dropping, prices dropping, inventories going up. Are we likely getting close to the waterfall part of the real estate collapse? It depends where you're at, but um, uh, real estate on an average basis should be peaking here in 24. Um <clears throat> And moving back down, but you you also have a lot of migration. So a lot of people, like in the states, they're leaving the blue states and going to Florida. Um, I mean, I can tell you that traffic has absolutely at least doubled since I moved here. Uh, it's it's horrible. Even you know, what used to take me fifteen minutes can take forty five minutes to get there now. Um, it's just that every. I mean, I was even in Texas, and a lot of our clients and you know, went to dinner with in um, in Austin, and they all wanted to move to, to Florida. And I asked them why, and they said people are getting stabbed from in malls and stuff. The migrants are all over the place. And he said, which is, which is true, he says, Florida, they got to at least swim to get to you. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's more and more people just keep moving to Florida, and it's, it's incredible. Canada saw its biggest population increase last year since 1957 up 2.3 something like a million more people is that contributing to the housing crisis because here we didn't have enough houses before these people got here uh yes i mean uh i want to you know i point out one thing i mean back in 1998 uh hong kong knew i knew the australian government and they asked me if I would negotiate with them to buy an island so they could move rather than, you know, handing it back to China, et cetera. And I met with the Prime Minister, Paul Keating. And um, everything I said at the time, and I think he was treasurer at that time, uh, then he became Prime Minister. And I said, look, you know, I got a blank check here. I can pay off your national debt. And everything I asked for it was no, no, no. And I finally, you know, I it just made no sense. And I said to him, I said, is this racist? You don't like Chinese or something? <clears throat> and he said, no. He said, they're fleeing uh, communism. He was a labor government. He said, if we let them in, they would vote conservative and change the politics of the country. That's what this migration is all about. Uh, the, the, the left knows it's losing, and they, are, they want as many of these people to come in as possible, and they're doing the same thing in Europe, because they think they can shore up their political power. And um, so they're basically destroying our cultures, our, you know, they're, I mean, everything just is all, and this is all being done for politics. Could wiping out the real estate market fit with the Agenda 2030 plan where, quote, you will own nothing and be happy, unquote? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I know <clears throat> Klaus Schwab. I mean, he's just a, he literally has a, a, a bust of Lenin on his bookshelf. <laughs> um, 
Klaus has always been that way. He's a leftist. He's an academic. Just about everybody in, in academia are, are always leftists. And um, his ideas do not work. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, he had, I had even gone to China, uh, was invited to China and, and helping them be, you know, becoming more capitalistic. And I saw why it failed. I mean, there were 249 varieties of tea, and they were tracking everything, but they were not interfering. And the questions I got was, well, why is this tea selling for a dollar here but $5 over there? I said, well, where is it manufactured at first? They, well, here. I said, well, first you have commu- you know, transportation costs. It was like, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, you know. In communism, if it was a dollar here, it had to be a dollar there, even if it cost you ten dollars to get it there. Um, so that's why communism it does not work. Um, it's not practical. Uh, you'll own nothing, and you will not be happy. Uh, and neither will society. Society does not advance without somebody actually creating things. And if you're not allowed to think, you know, individually or create something, um, you're not going to move. I mean, that's the famous kitchen debate with Richard Nixon and Khrushchev. We're showing the, the kitchen and what Americans had versus uh, in Russia. And he says, this is all private sector created it, not government. Could cryptocurrencies have been created to be placeholders for CBDC, central bank digital currencies? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> look, it, it's, you, you take Bitcoin. If this was really created individually by people that, oh, we are afraid of central banks and all the rest of the nonsense that they put out, then why would you make it so that uh, the blockchain and it can be traced? So if I give you a $100 bill, they don't know where I came from. But if I give you a 100 in Bitcoin, they know where I got it from. They can trace it all the way back. That is not freedom. Uh, That is not... um, what you would expect from the private sector who's anti-government. Uh, it's just, I honestly think the government created it. Um, and I mean, nobody knows who did this real blockchain stuff. And, but um, now you have these CBDCs and they're all going to be traceable. Uh, this is the future. Uh, I can tell you, I've been in meetings and why they're doing it is because they are so convinced that we, the public, are a bunch of scumbags, and we don't pay the taxes that we really should. They think in Europe, Canada, U.S., the consensus is if they eliminate cash, you know, they will collect 35% more in taxes. They just feel that everybody just doesn't really pay what they're supposed to. And I said before, if you hire that 16-year-old girl next door to watch the kids while you and your wife go out to dinner and you gave her $50, oh, my God, she didn't pay any taxes. (laughs) You know, this is, I mean, these people don't sleep at nights over this. You had Janet Yellen, uh, I mean, saying, oh, well, we're going to, you know, lower the threshold for, for audits down to $600 to get the rich. You know, their definition of rich is anybody with a job anymore. I mean, I don't think Elon Musk is selling a, a, a used bike on, on eBay for $600. The Baltimore Bridge accident or black swan terror attack? Probably a questionable accident. All right. And why I say that is that the same ship happened to be in uh, an incident in, um, in Belgium, in Antwerp also. Um, but what is strange is usually there would be tugboats there, um, taking it out, etc. Nothing was there. Uh, they claimed they had a power failure, um, so they couldn't, you know, <clears throat> blast the bridge or anything like that. Uh, it's you, they have no backup. Uh, it's either <clears throat> really a ship that is so, you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, not kept up to speed, not, you know, the systems. I mean, uh, why would you take a ship like that and and it loses power? <clears throat> um, I don't know. It just does not seem uh, – it, it's 
I don't think it was a a, tr- a terrorist attack, um, but it's certainly you know incompetence on on a major level. Poor maintenance and a company that doesn't care. But probably uh, you got all these companies just trying to cut corners, etc. At this stage in the game, but there should have been tugboats taking this down the river. What? Where were they? It, well, of course, it's one o'clock in the, in the morning. I mean, it's. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of things that are very strange about it. That That's for sure. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it was a terrorist attack. Um, I mean, it's it, maybe it was loaded with cargo. Is diversity, equity, and inclusion the path to Marxism? Oh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> we're all equal in rights, but not in talent. Um, you know, do you pay me the same price that you would pay uh, a quarterback if I can't throw the ball like he can, I mean, you know, come on. I mean, we all, we're, everybody has different things. I mean, some people can be a brain surgeon and other people can be a mechanic. Uh, and the fair value for the labor is based upon the quantity. If they're, you know, you had everybody and his brother wanted to be a brain surgeon, then the price is going to come down. Um, but, you know, we're equal in rights, not in talent. And and that's the whole problem with, you know, the whole Marxist agenda. Uh, and, you know, Marx was just, oh, well, they made a profit off your labor. And they wouldn't make that profit without your labor. But the labor wouldn't have a job unless somebody created a company to hire them. You know, it, uh, and Marx never... <clears throat> attributed anything to ingenuity or, or invention. You know, he just hated somebody like, uh, you know, Henry Ford, who happened to create the assembly line. And if he didn't, cars would have never came down for the average person. Um, so, I mean, we're equal in rights. We're not equal in talent. Is it true during uh, communist Russia that the little private gardens farmers were allowed to hold produce more food than the giant collective farms? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, there's a movie on this, actually, Mr. Jones, I think it's called. Um, And because what happened was in communism, uh, like Marx, oh, you own nothing and be happy. (laughs) They seized all the the big farms. And then it's like putting somebody in charge that runs, you know, uh, a DMV office in charge of farming. Had no idea when to plant or anything. There was a massive food shortage, and then they stole the food from Ukraine to pretend that communism was working. So seven million Ukrainians died, um, and the New York Times is saying, "Oh, Stalinism is working. It's working." It was not. It was all fraud. But um, you know, the the small garden at home, the guy knew what he was doing. <clears throat> Rather than a bureaucrat that has no concept of of anything to do with with farming, making the decisions, what to plant, when he, he got everything wrong, and and Russia would have completely starved, and there would have been a major revolution if they did not steal the food from Ukraine. All over mainstream media, ISIS is taking responsibility for the terror attack in Russia. Who do you think is really responsible for the terror attack? Uh, Ukraine in the West. <laughs> Um, look, anybody can pick up a phone and say, oh, we take responsibility. Look at the, everybody that I know that, that has anything to do with geopolitics does not believe that story. Uh, Russia came out actually, um, and just said that they believe Ukraine, uh, Britain and U.S. were involved and they're correct. I mean, if this was a terrorist attack, uh, they die in the attack because that's how they go to heaven. All right, it's a holy war. You don't, you know, kill a whole bunch of people and then try to escape to Ukraine. Secondly, Putin is supporting Iran. All right, so why would these types of terrorists that are anti, you know, Israel, etc., then suddenly attack Russia? It makes no sense. And they never did before. So, I mean, um, this is part of the agenda that is, and I've warned that going into May, they're desperate to try and create some sort of a false flag. And because they want Russia to attack a NATO entity 
Um, <clears throat> and so they can claim that Russia is the aggressor. Uh, but this terrorist attack was carried out by Ukrainians. Um, uh, the same thing with Buka. I mean, even the, you know, the, the government had to come out and said there's no evidence that Russia did anything there either. It was all fiction and made up. Um, I mean, I've seen videos where you see bodies laying on the road, and then, you know, they start to get up when the van passes off. Uh, it, you know, Ukrainians are, are masters at, at propaganda. Um, that's what they're really known for, and this is... Ukraine is on the verge of collapsing. Um, even Zelensky came out, I think it was like a couple of weeks ago, denying reports and says, no, 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 we can decide if we want peace itself. And that's nonsense. They had a peace deal, worked out. Boris Johnson from Britain hopped on a plane, went over there and killed it and says, you're not allowed to, to seek peace with Russia. And you know, that made the press in, U in Ukraine. I mean, I've, you know, I can tell you there are a lot of people, Ukrainians, that want to have Zelensky killed. They would love to see him assassinated. They feel that he's a, um, he has basically been a traitor to their own country. Uh, when he was elected, he ran for peace, and he's done everything opposite. Um, I mean, even in these stupid laws that uh, he puts in art to create war. He outlawed Russian language. He's now even gone as far as to outlaw the the uh, Orthodox Christian language or, or religion. And they have to celebrate Christmas on December 25th, not January. Um, I mean, just look at it this way. If, if Canada stood up and said, okay, fine, we're going to outlaw French, I think you're going to go into a civil war as well. <laughs> you, know? uh, you can't do these kinds of things. I mean, you know, what kind of a government does that? Would the United States say we're going to outlaw Spanish? Um, you know, these things are deliberately made to create, you know, discord. And um, but the neocons have been wanting to do this. The the 2014 revolution. I mean, just you know, do a little bit of your own research, and you'll see that what mainstream media keeps putting out is nothing but Western propaganda. Um, in the 2014 revolution there in Ukraine, who was there? Victoria Nuland, uh, and there was a leak that, uh, uh, you know, uh, of a phone call that she was making. It said, F, you know, the EU, we're putting in our people. And they put in an interim government. They immediately told the inter interim government to attack the Donbass. Okay? This was all unelected. And after... You ended up with uh, the election, <clears throat> you know, and like I said, you can also Google it. Um, Zelensky was running on peace. Vote for me and I'll end this thing with Russia and seek peace. And that's what everybody voted for. Um, we had two Ukrainian um, employees, one in the Kiev and one in Donetsk, one on each side. They're both in Berlin right now. Over 8 million people have fled the country. And over half a million people have died on the battlefields since Boris Johnson killed the the, um, the peace deal. I mean, Zelensky is not well received. That's why he's also suspended and said, oh, martial law, and there'll be no elections, because he's a dictator. That's not democracy. Um, we didn't suspend our elections during World War II. You know, it's, but he knows that he would be he would lose in the polls uh, if there was ever any kind of election that people would vote him out. Uh, they wanted peace. What? Where does this benefit Ukraine at all? Um, it, it just simply does not. They've been used, you know, and abused, and a lot of people in Ukraine are you know, waking up to this. They realize this has got nothing to do with their country or anything else. This is the West using them as cannon fodder. As simple as that. So they were virtually on the on very close to to collapse. That's why Macron came out and said, "Well, you know, we should be sending in NATO troops to Ukraine." Poland came out and said the same thing. They wouldn't be saying this if they had the troops. They don't. Okay, and this desperate attack on Moscow is them. It's a 
you know, what they call a Hail Mary, basically, praying, please, Russia, attack something over here so we can bring in all the West. That's what they want. They want World War Three. It's election season. What do you think the powers that be will try to do to the people this time to instill fear in order to rig the election? Uh, well, the two main things is one is that they're, you know, all the migrants, they, um, you even have Mississippi already trying to pass a law that they're allowed to vote. Um, and, you know, the, you got many of the Democrats saying that they can vote. You know, well, if you don't have to be a citizen to vote, please, everybody from Canada also vote. You know, Europe should be voting. Why not? Um, I mean, this is, you know, just gets to be absurd. I, I can't go to Canada and vote in your election. <laughs> but um, the other thing is that that they are desperately afraid of Donald Trump and that if he wins, he would then fire all the neocons like he did before. Trump's against war. Um, I went to Mar-a-Lago for dinner back in March of 20 when he was president, and I was actually impressed. It was the first time I ever heard any head of state, and what he said then was that he wanted to pull the troops out of Afghanistan, but the reason was, he said, he was sick and tired of writing letters to their families that their son died, uh, you know, for what, he said. They've been fighting over borders for a thousand years. What difference are we going to make? That's why he wanted to get out. All right. And, you know, I've been, I've known many heads of state, was personal friends with Maggie Thatcher. She had the Falklands War. I never heard any head of state ever once speak of any remorse for the people that actually die on the battlefield. So they are scared to death. Uh, he fired John Bolton. Um, I mean, he would invade Canada to get one Russian. Uh, it, Victoria Newland. I mean, all these these people, they're just consumed with hatred. And they know if Trump gets in, he's cleaning house. Uh, so basically, what I am concerned about is that they are desperate to create um, World War III before the election, uh, because this theory is no president has ever lost uh, during times of war. So, you know, pay attention uh, to May. Uh, I would be very concerned about there. I hope Putin does not uh, respond um, in kind, or if he does in kind, it would be a terrorist-type attack that he can say no to as well. But, um, but if he actually takes any sort of a direct um, attack, uh, then they're going to say, see, he's the aggressor and everybody's in. What are C-40 cities, and can they be stopped? Uh, again, it, it's part of this whole nonsense that, uh, uh, you know, the whole 15-minute city stuff that you don't need cars. Uh, you know, all I can say is these people are, are quite deranged, and, and it's, it's they don't understand analysis or even how to conduct it. And... Um, the world does not function in a linear fashion. And like I said, you know, they just take the same thing uh, all the time. And that's what they do. Um, they assume that, you know, whatever trend in motion will always stay in motion and will never change. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I just am very skeptical about, you know, this whole thing, Um but, you know, the C40 is a global network of mayors of the world, you know, leading cities that are united in action to confront climate crisis. Uh, it's, um, there is no climate crisis. You know, we've got a political crisis is what we got. We've heard the U.N. is actually running Canada. Could this be true? Yes, that's what all this... Um, you know, Klaus Schwab has been with his young leaders infiltrating... He's very aggressive, all right? And the U.N., you have to understand, they want power. They're not trying to take over the world like Napoleon with the, with troops coming in. They're trying to do it covertly <clears throat> with the pen. And um, this whole climate change, the reason is being pushed is because no single country 
like these 40 cities. No single country can possibly defend against climate change. It's going to take us all, and therefore there has to be a central authority. And guess what? That's the United Nations. Um, at their climate you know, agenda you know, big conference a few years ago, I can tell you, because I know people that were there, absolutely nobody that disagreed was ever allowed to even speak. That's not freedom of speech. That's not science. Um, and because this has got a political agenda to it, and the U.N. is trying to basically run everything. The same thing with who is coming out with all this stuff. We will determine when a pandemic is, and you will shut down when we tell you to. Uh, who are these people? They're completely unelected. There, there is no democracy. Forget that. A lot of people have taken a number of experimental medical procedures over the past three years. Are these people changing mentally for the worse? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's um, I don't get into the medical thing so much, but I, honestly, um, before COVID, I would get you know the you know the flu shot or whatever. After COVID, forget it. I will not. Um, I decline at this stage because it's just um, when they get absolute immunity for everything, then why would you even trust them for anything? Uh, with COVID, I mean, I go get my hair cut and both of the, the elderly women lost their son-in-laws in their 20s uh, within weeks of being vaccinated. Both of them died. The, the girl right next door to me that lives, she was 27 years old, got it. She had COVID, but had to get a COVID shot to go on a family cruise. The next day they took her out of here in an ambulance. She almost died uh, from the heart uh, problems. I mean, it seems as though the younger people were hit with the heart issues. Um, my <clears throat> attorney from up in Philadelphia got the, the vaccine so he could travel, and now he gets blood clots, and so he won't fly anymore. Uh, you, you know, look, I mean, there's something seriously wrong here. They just bribed all these politicians to get away with this stuff. And, I mean, can you imagine if uh, General Motors put out a car and one in a thousand blows up when you just put the key in it? Oh, but they're immune, so you can't sue them. So why would they fix it? You, you don't do that. It's They should not be immune um, and they know that everybody that gets a vaccine, that some people are going to die. They know that. Uh, I have one guy that, that works for me. His whole family came and get a flu shot. They get seriously sick. We're all not the same. Some people no problem. Other people, they, they do. You can't mandate that everybody has to have something. And what's going on in, in Chicago right now? <clears throat> These migrants are in there, they're refusing to get vaccinated, and the government says, oh, that's okay, you don't have to be. They can be. We lose our jobs if we're not. Something is seriously wrong here. We've heard of squatters legally taking over people's homes in New York as well as Spain. Is this the latest nightmare being unleashed upon the world by the powers that be? Yeah, look, I mean, there's there's TikTok videos out there, you know, any house that's not occupied, we can take it, telling all these migrants just to go in and just, you know, squat. That's it. Authoritarian, authoritarian governments have entrenched themselves around the world. Election fraud could keep them in place. How does society get rid of authoritarian governments? Well, you know, it's, it's what they say about communism. You can vote your way in, but you got to shoot your way out. Uh, unfortunately, um, <clears throat> that's history. I mean, that's what, you know, even Thomas Jefferson said, you know, revolution is inevitable. Um, you can't have a government that just ignores everybody. We got the power and you're going to do as I tell you. And eventually that leads to revolution. Um, and I think that's what our computer is projecting. We're seeing um, this 2024 election. I don't care who wins. The computer is showing a sharp rise in civil unrest afterwards. Neither side's going to believe whoever won. It's the country's become so polarized um, because of all this propaganda back and forth in the press. And um, then we got international war. I don't see this surviving. Our form of governments, republics, 
um, are coming to an end, the same way monarchy did. Uh, hopefully, after 2032, we go to a real direct democracy. Um, but we, they claim we live in a democracy when we do not. We don't get asked, shall we go to war with Russia, yes or no? Nobody asks us that question. They just make the decisions themselves. Um, and, you know, COVID shots. Everybody will do this. You know, it, it's, this is not government. Civilization exists when it's beneficial to everybody. When one side starts to become the oppressor of the other side, it fails. All right. His history is the witness to that. Eventually, it leads to revolution. Where can people buy your report, the 2024 Outlook, the year from political hell? Um, on our website at uh, armstrongeconomics.com. Um, the, the books are available on uh, Amazon. You can go on Amazon for the books um, the, that I've done, uh, manipulating the world economy, the, you know, plot to seize Russia, the civil, you know, the cycles of war, et cetera. All that is, is on, um, is on Amazon. Marty, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Well, thank you for inviting me, Jim, and take care up there. My guest has been Martin Armstrong, founder of Armstrong Economics, available online at armstrongeconomics.com. He was speaking to us from Florida. Coming up, Wolf Richter, next on This Week in Money. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated. Trades on the TSX Venture AMY. On the OTCQB AMYZF. And Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclico.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He's speaking to us from San Francisco. Welcome back to the show, Wolf. Thanks for having me back, Jim. Wolf, are home prices for new homes and existing homes in the U.S. finally reacting to the heat from higher interest rates? Yeah, we have seen a pretty good reaction uh, in, the, in the existing home market in that uh, we've had a beautiful double peak, and uh, this shows up in just about all the data where we had the surge uh, peaking in, in mid-2022, and that's when uh, the interest rates started rising and uh, the quantitative tightening started. And so home prices fell, and then they rose again last year, early uh, last year, and uh, to sort of peak again, and now, now they're heading down off that second peak. So we've had this. Uh, so if you look at it a little bit longer term, there's really no price change essentially for a couple of years. That comes after this huge gigantic spike that we've had over the prior two years. So that's in the existing home market, in the in the new house market. So these are new houses, new single family houses that are being built and sold by home builders. So they're not really they're not trading, yeah. So it, it's really not a trading price. It's it's a, a home builder selling a new house, and uh, those prices have have dropped by 19 percent from the peak. Now we've got the latest numbers, and uh, their home builders are doing that uh, with various means. And that 19 percent drop doesn't even include the mortgage rate buy downs that more that home builders are offering to to buyers. So that's just uh, the price, uh, and the price itself is uh, is being managed down by these home builders because they're building smaller houses now. They're putting in fewer amenities and lower priced amenities, and they're trying to cut the price uh, as much as possible. Their the profit margins have come down. They were really fat during the pandemic, and they've come down by several percentage points. D. R. Horton, which is our largest uh, publicly traded home builder here. Uh, their their profit margin, their gross profit margins came down by five percentage points. So that's a big drop, and uh, they're now kind of back where they were before the pandemic. So that that excess profit has been worked out. Uh, the homes are getting smaller, 
amenities are getting cheaper and fewer. So that's where the 19% price drop comes from. In addition to that, home builders are uh, buying down mortgage rates or they're offering uh, lower rates, and that costs a lot of money to the home builder. Uh, so a, uh, a buyer of a new house can get a 5% 30-year fixed rate mortgage from a home builder uh, when the market rate may be 7%. For the same mortgage, but that costs the home builder lots of money to do. So and that doesn't show up in the price. It shows up in the profit margins, and that's where we've seen the profit margins come down. So with these measures, home builders now home builders, you got to remember, they're the pros. They know the market. They've got to sell. They've got to build and sell houses. That's what they do. They can't just not do that. They cannot outweigh this market. They have to be in this market. They have to play in this market, and they understand this market. So they have cut the prices of their houses that they sell and and they're buying down these mortgage rates have cut the profit margins that way and so their sales have held up so new house sales uh have been reasonably good uh they're kind of where they were in 2019 they've come down off the peak in in uh, 2021 22 but uh, they're they're kind of where they were in 2019 and and that's a pretty good level whereas sales of existing houses have completely uh, plunged they're down 20 25% from before the pandemic and they're down a lot more uh, from the peak of the pandemic uh so uh home sellers homeowners they want to sell the home they they haven't gotten the message yet they're they're still trying to outweigh this market they're still trying to to wait for the 3% mortgage to come back, and, and that's very unlikely to happen. And uh, so they're, they're playing this wait-and-see game, whereas the, the home builders are eating uh, the homeowner's lunch. You know, they're getting market share. They're getting a large share of that market, and it's now with the mortgage rate buy-downs. Uh, you can buy, on a monthly payment basis, you can buy a new house for less than a, a used house, an existing home, um, yeah, you know, with the mortgage payment and all other uh, uh, costs included, so that's the arbitrage that's now being made. Uh, and and this is an amazing thing to see the the prices between new houses and and uh, existing houses have narrowed to historically low level. And with the mortgage rate buy downs, the mortgage payments are actually cheaper on on many new houses than it would be to to buy an equivalent house and finance it. So that's the housing market in the United States. It's the home builders, the pros have figured it out, and and they're making hay. And yeah, they're doing it at the expense of their profit margins, and uh, they're doing it at expense of 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 the prices that they're getting for their houses. But they're doing pretty well, and and uh, you know, and Americans are are very open to that. They don't feel like they have to have these huge houses anymore. They're willing to buy something a little smaller and uh, with a little bit fewer, uh, less expensive amenities, and, and they're fine with that. And so it, it has turned out to be uh, the, the thing to do, and, and uh, existing homes, they, the homeowners, you know, they, they sell their existing houses. They're having uh, trouble figuring this out, but we're seeing some changes on that uh, now. Asking prices for n- new uh, homes in the United States have have dropped below a year ago uh, levels, and so that's that hasn't happened in a while. Uh, so we see in the spring selling season now we see the pricing environment weakening for existing homes. We see a lot more inventory come on the market. Uh, we see uh, active listings uh, surging. And uh, the inventory is sitting, you know, the sales are pretty low, and, and so it's, it's accumulating. And, and so and, and new listings are, are, are starting to pile up. So we're seeing that the market change a little bit on the existing home side, and as, as homeowners are starting to, to try to, to play with the market as it exists, home builders, yeah, they're, <laughs> they have figured this out a year ago, and so they're way ahead of this. If interest rates move lower, would home prices move higher? Well, so prices are not going up. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're not going up in the United States, and they have fallen pretty sharply in, in Canada. They've fallen in a bunch of markets in the United States, and that's becoming apparent. They're going up in, in a few markets still, and, and they've stabilized there too, actually. Um, 
So waiting uh, f- uh, for lower mortgage rates when when you buy, uh, I mean, that's a gamble. Uh, there is almost no chance we're going to get the 3% mortgage back. And we've had uh, inflation uh, that's back to normal, back to the, the way it used to be, you know, that, and, and when we had, uh, it's the 1980s, 1990, of course, we had much more inflation in the 1980s, but in the 1990s, 2000s, you know, we've had that kind of inflation rate and mortgage rates are going to be higher during those inflationary times. So waiting for lower mortgage rates, um, you yeah, know, that's, that's a gamble. Um, yeah, yeah. Lower mortgage rates would might trigger increase in home prices, and might not. And we've had we've had this phenomenon during the financial crisis, where uh, mortgage rates uh, were pushed down by the Fed by a huge amount, and home prices continued to plunge for four years. So uh, they collapsed by fifty percent, roughly, in many markets. So it it doesn't necessarily entail an increase in home prices when mortgage rates go down. It just depends on a lot of other things, um, but. Yeah, there is another arbitrage here, and that's buying a new house instead of an existing home. So that brings the mortgage payment down. Plus, you don't have the um, you don't have the maintenance and, and all these other issues you get with an older house. Uh, you can rent the same house as you can buy it for a lot less per month, and the the, the differences are now substantial. So, and the some of the big uh, landlords uh, that that are actually building houses for rent. Uh, they they said that uh, their rental rates are roughly twelve hundred dollars a month lower uh, than the cost and the monthly cost of buying the same house in more expensive cities. It's, the difference is two thousand dollars or more. So uh, these are monthly savings that uh, people can have uh, when they rent instead of when they buy. So it it there's a, there's a lot of different options out there now for people to look at. And I mean, the obviously worst thing you can do is is buy a home at the peak of the market. We don't know where the peak is, but uh, if you do that, uh, you'll be in this house for a long time before the price catches back up. And we've seen some of the local markets do that. And I cite Tulsa, Oklahoma, because that's where I used to live. Home prices went down a lot uh, for a very long time, and they didn't go back to where they were decades later, decades. So it. It uh, it can be a very long time to outweigh something like that. How are the most splendid housing bubbles in Canada doing? Yeah, the most splendid housing bubbles. That's my series, and I uh, started that years ago to document uh, some of the crazy bubbles that uh, housing bubbles that we have in in Canada and in the United States. I have two separate series for that, and I've called them the most splendid housing bubbles because they're, they're truly magnificent, and uh, so. They ran into a little bit of trouble in Canada, and um, obviously Calgary is is still hot. But uh, the uh, the Toronto, uh, the Greater Toronto area, and and uh, and surrounding metros, you know, there that's the area that's that's hardest hit. Uh, condo prices in in the uh, uh, Greater Toronto area. Have hit lows not seen since since uh, like October 2021. Uh, house prices haven't dropped quite that far, but they've they're down a bunch too. Uh, Vancouver has seen a smaller downturns in 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 pricing, but they've come down too. And uh, so it 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 goes metro by metro, and they're all different. Um, Except in, among the major metros, except for Calgary's, uh, Calgary, they're they're all down quite a bit to a lot. And uh, I mean, I'm just looking at the uh, the Toronto area condos. Um, I mean, that's you're looking at a price roll back that takes you back to October 2021. And um, it, it it yeah, these kinds of things when they start, they can go a lot further. And when something is so horribly overpriced uh, that People can't afford it anymore, and and it doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, yeah, when the when the downtrend starts, you don't really know where it's going, and and uh, uh, it's not just a factor of mortgage rates; it's a factor of many other things. And and so it's it, it, my most splendid housing uh, bubble charts have kind of have turned around in a serious way. That that wasn't that wasn't the plan, but but that's what happened, and they're they're, they're showing some dramatic. Uh, southward movement here now of course the average calgary uh, house price right now five hundred sixty seven thousand dollars 
in Vancouver, that won't even buy you a doghouse. <laughs> yeah, that's that's part of the arbitrage people are doing. If they can live anywhere, uh, they can go to a place where or you know, have a good life and and prices are cheaper. Uh, if they have to live where they work, then they're somewhat handicapped in what they can choose. And and that's obviously working from home has has made that possible. But not everybody works from home, so a lot of times you have a career that you want to build. And you have to live where you work, and and so lots of people don't have the choice, the option to to live where where houses are cheaper. Yeah, the average house price in Vancouver is one million one hundred eighty three thousand. So you could almost buy two houses in Calgary for that. Yeah, yeah, but you probably make less money too. So unless you work in the oil patch there. Oh yeah. Uh, well, Alberta doesn't have a sales tax, so right there you're saving money. Yeah. Oh. An overwhelming majority of analysts are calling for Fed rate cuts this year. Is higher inflation predicting higher rates instead of lower rates? Yeah, so we had a rate cut mania here that started last uh, November. And, uh, and at some point, people and markets were betting on five, six, seven rate cuts in 2024, each rate cut being 25 basis points or a quarter percentage point. And uh, since then, uh, the Fed has pushed back against that pretty dramatically in a way that I've really not seen it before. And we've had two really awful inflation readings, January and February, uh, that came on top of um, inflation readings. So these are the underlying readings we're looking at, especially in services that have been going up for months. So that actually was just uh, part of a trend in January and February when you look at the charts that started uh, in, in, in in the fall last year. And uh, so the first increase in January, the first NAST reading in January was sort of written off as a one-time blip and maybe it'll just go away. And then we'll get the other one in February. And so now it's not a one-time blip anymore. And uh, so now everybody is, has to has to recalibrate where this is going, and and uh, it and when you look at services inflation, and this is really where inflation is now, um, it hasn't really backed off much. It, it's kind of been the in the same very high range for months, and it it just went a lot higher in February, January, and February, but it's been in that very high range. And what has happened is energy prices have collapsed really. And uh, prices of durable goods have come down very hard and, and actually declined. Um, so that has pushed down the overall inflation readings. But the services inflation were services were consumers spent 65% of the money. So the, the services inflation has never really declined. And now it's, it's picking back up. And that's a real concern because uh, inflation is very hard to get rid of in services. And uh, so that's, that's housing, that's insurance, it's health care. It's all these things, and and uh, people spend a lot of money on in the United States, and and, uh, uh, and and it's gotten in some of those things. It's it, it's traveling, anything having to do with travel, uh, hotels, uh, airline flights, uh, all those kinds of things are services, and, and people have gone on a revenge spending in, in traveling, and, and they're, so they're, they're going all over the place. And, um, and this has put a lot of demand on the system. And, and so service inflation is just, just really hot. And uh, so once that comes to the surface and, and the, 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 the mainstream media start talking about it a little bit, uh, you can see, yeah, you can see some anxiety about that. And uh, obviously the Fed's been aware of that. And, and so now they, they're dialing back uh, uh, the rate cut scenario. Uh, they're, we we've had the, the, they, the, the Fed publishes what's called a dot plot, so that's projection of where they see the rates uh, end at, at the year end. And in December, so they do that four times a year. In December, they uh, envisioned uh, four uh, three rate cuts in in so one uh, like in the second half of 2024. Uh, we just got a new dot plot in, in the March meeting, and they're still envisioning three rate cuts. But now the number of people, the number of members that see those dramatically drop. This it's only by one member uh, that they see three. If if this one if one more member switches, then they'll see only two red cuts. 
And so that was a dramatic change in the underlying, you know, there's 20 of them, 19 of them. So, um, and so that, that happened in March. Uh, there's a lot of talk about one red cut now among Fed heads. And uh, uh, the, the scenario is this, when inflation uh, reheats, you can't really cut rates into reheating inflation. That's just the opposite of what the Fed will do. So, uh, yeah, in theory, they could hike rates, but they're probably not going to do that for a while. They're probably not going to do that this year, uh, for sure, uh, this election year. But um, they're going to wait and see. That's that's the policy. Now, we'll wait and see. We, we'll, we'll watch this develop. And uh, so when inflation readings come in fairly hot, uh, they'll say, oh, we'll wait and see. And, and so... You know, meeting by meeting, the rate cuts vanish, and uh, in in the future, and and so I think there's a very good chance that we get either no rate cuts this year at all, or and and that would be the, the kind of what the Fed likes to do during an election year, actually not do anything, not change policy at all. That's sort of uh, the 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 preferred method of what the Fed wants, and and so it doesn't get uh, accused of political meddling, and uh, or it may cut once and be done and uh, just to, to, to nod a little bit in, in the direction of those that say that rates are too high and and it's, that's kind of the scenario where we are I think and and um, it, it in, in this environment where you know, the data is not super reliable it, it it fluctuates dramatically you can't really base a decision on one month's data point so you have to look at at the at month after month after month and then watch the trend and, and we're all doing that. And um, so in that, in that scenario, wait and see is a good policy. You know, to, to, the rates are high, fairly high here. They're five and a half percent at the, at the top end. And um, it's, it's a good place to pause and, and to watch and, and to see whether inflation is reheating, which is, seems to be doing right now, or whether this reheating process of the last few months was uh, just a quirk, and and, it, and the inflation is starting to recool again, and uh, and then if inflation cools, you, you can cut a little bit. But right now we're on the wrong side of that equation. Right now we see inflation reheat, and and, uh, and that's yeah, it's not a good place to be. And um, you know, wait and see. I think is probably pretty good policy. Yeah, just doing a little online research. Vancouver has dropped to the most third most unaffordable city out of more than ninety major global markets. Monaco is still the most expensive, followed by Hong Kong. And yet, all these homeless people move to Vancouver expecting a free house. <laughs> yeah, maybe some of ours came up there. What's the latest t- trend on commercial real estate? Yeah, so that's not improving in at all. That that'll be many years for that to work out. Um, or just a couple of years into it, uh, there's several issues. One issue is the higher interest rate. So uh, higher interest rates cause uh, valuations and prices of commercial real estate to drop, and that's just just like bond prices. That's just that's just almost automatic. And we went from record low interest rates back to normal interest rates. So a lot of these property values have plunged. And uh, commercial mortgages are such that uh, many of them have balloon payments after X number of years, after 10 years, after five years. So they have to be refinanced. But when the property value drops so much, uh, that is not enough collateral for the same amount of loan. The landlords can't refinance. So... Uh, then you have a default there, and, and so landlords are using that to renegotiate the mortgage. Uh, lots of landlords have let the building go back to lenders. And so that's a process related to interest rates. And uh, then we have other issues that are structural that have nothing to do with interest rates. And so retail, so that's malls and big shops, that kind of things. Retail real estate has been in horrible shape for, for many years. Uh, I started my series on the brick and mortar meltdown in 2017 to document some of this. And it's one chain store after another files for bankruptcy and was liquidated and malls went bankrupt and, and, uh, and, and getting bulldozed and turned into housing and those kinds of things. That's been going on for many years. So the retail space of commercial real estate 
uh, a big, big part of it. You know, it's in bad shape. Uh, strip malls anchored by grocery stores and some service uh, uh, shops like uh, restaurants and nail salons, hair salons are, are doing pretty well. But the, the big malls, uh, they're having real trouble. Cinemas or the, the multiplexes, all of that's involved in it. And it's got huge problems, and that's not related to interest rates. It's related to structural changes in how Americans buy stuff and, and how they watch movies. So um, that that's going to play out in that these the big malls are going to get uh, uh, bulldozed and they're going to be redeveloped in something else. In San Francisco, we've got a big mall like that. Uh, that is now, uh, they're planning 3,000 housing units on it. And uh, you've got a lot of parking. A mall is big, a lot of surface. So they've got a big parking area there and, and some buildings, big buildings. And so they're going to keep some... Uh, it continues to be a shopping area in some sense. They're going to have a main street where people can walk down the shops both sides, and then they're going to have over 3,000 housing units on it. You know, that's the way to go in a, in a place where uh, real estate is expensive. If you have a mall out there at, a, at an intersection of, a, of two highways um, in, in the middle of the country, you know, that, that may not be possible to do that financially and, and you'll just have to figure out some other thing. Now with office, we have the problem that we have huge, huge, huge availability rates. There, there's in San Francisco, a third of the, of the office space is, is on the market for lease. Um, so property values have collapsed. The older office towers are worth essentially only the land value. Um, so that's, this whole sector is being repriced right now. With lots of defaults. The good thing is that, uh, especially with office, uh, a big part of uh, the real estate loans are held by investors, not banks. And investors have been taking huge losses on so commercial mortgage-backed securities, collateralized loan obligations, uh, mortgage reads, uh, PE firms, uh, those kind of uh, funds, and life insurance companies, uh, those kind of funds have gobbled up uh, this, this office debt, and that's not blowing up. We've had uh, some banks confess to it, and including foreign banks. Now, that's another thing. We're talking about banks, but a big part of that, or some part of that is foreign banks, and the Deutsche Bank and banks in Japan and the Canadian banks, too, are exposed to commercial real estate loans. So uh, the uh, U.S. bank exposure to to this troubled commercial real estate debt is 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 not huge. And uh, that's a good thing because, uh, you know, the banking system is by nature fragile and uh, there, there could be a financial crisis if it were uh, too much exposure on it. And that's not the case. The Fed can easily let uh, investors uh, take huge losses on the commercial real estate holdings, and it has been doing that. But allowing the banking system to collapse is not something the Fed will let happen. So uh, we're finding that out a lot of times with these big office towers the debt, uh, uh, you know, it's defaulted on, and the lender takes back the property. It's not a bank that owns it. It's a, it's investors in commercial mortgage-backed securities or, or mortgage REITs or something like that. Hotels have had a huge problem, too. The hotel properties, not the hotel operators, but the hotel properties, because uh, you know, they have value issues, so they're defaulting on their loans now. Um, and most of that is helped by investors, not by banks. In the multifamily sector, commercial real estate, now there's, there's always demand in multifamily. We've got a growing population. That we're not going to run out of demand for apartments, but uh, they have the same issue with mortgage rates. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the interesting thing there is the majority of those uh, multifamily loans are actually held by the government or government-sponsored enterprises are guaranteed by them so that uh, uh, banks and investors uh, hold a minority share, and, uh, and investors hold a bunch of them. So banks really are not heavily exposed to the multifamily sector here. And some smaller banks have specialized in it. And, and yeah, there, there'll be some banks that collapse. Some smaller banks will collapse. I and mean, we know that. Uh, we can see that. Uh, we're just waiting for it every day. And it's had, you know, we've had uh, a year ago, we've had uh, some bank collapses, but that wasn't because of bad credit. That was because of bank runs and, uh, and the drop in interest rates that caused uh, bonds to lose value. So there was another credit problem, uh, but there, there was this 
there was a run on the banks. And so now we've got credit problems. And so that's kind of the second phase in the banking crisis, except this time around the banks really aren't that exposed to, to commercial real estate. And that's a really good thing. And, and uh, <laughs> that's why I think the Fed will let that, uh, let that run its course. We need to reprice those buildings. Uh, they need to change ownership. Landlords uh, need to have a lower cost base. So the new landlord uh, with a lower cost ba- base can do something with their property, can redevelop it, can tear it down, can remodel it, and uh, that an existing landlord cannot do. And so that's what needs to happen, and it will take many years. And it's it's a good process. Why should you have a uh, central business district where nobody lives. It's a great thing to, to put housing in there, so to, to, to build some high-rise uh, condo and apartment buildings or to convert some of those office buildings, that those that can be converted. And uh, that will take many years, but that's a very good thing to do. And, and I'm, I'm actually looking forward for this development to play out. How does quantitative tightening affect U.S. dollar money flows all over the world? Well, I don't think it's, it's affected it much yet. There, there's still a huge amount of liquidity out there after all this money printing. Uh, what happened is uh, interest rates have gone up, and so the, the dollar, the do- dollar flows. We're talking about it. It's actually borrowing in dollars. So a company uh, issuing a, a foreign company, a company in Argentina, uh, issuing bonds in nominated in dollars, or you know, a government. Uh, such as Argentina, and uh, yeah, Argentina is always playing with defaults of this, that issue, but uh, other countries that have borrowed in dollars like Mexico and that have been much more responsible in handling their, their foreign debt, um, you know, they, they have to pay a lot more money to refinance those, those dollar bonds, and so uh, it's not that there is a shortage of dollars to do that. It, it just costs a lot more. It costs a lot more for the federal government to borrow money. It costs a lot more for companies and governments overseas to borrow uh, in dollars. So uh, that has happened. That's related to interest rates, and that's just a normal outgrowth of higher of normalizing interest rates. Really, that's what it is. Uh, but in in terms of dollar liquidity, it's still sloshing around everywhere knee deep, and as we can see in the markets, and uh, that quantitative tightening will eventually uh, uh, reduce that. But right now, and it has reduced it, but it, there's still so much out out there that it hasn't reduced it enough to where we can really see the effects of it. And uh, I mean, there's there's several more trillion to go, I think, and and uh, so. This, this will eventually become noticeable, but, but we're not there yet. Is there a trend change in people purchasing new and used vehicles? Yeah, so what happened during the pandemic uh, is that manufacturers that ran out of components because component man- makers ran out of semiconductors, uh, they uh, prioritized high-dollar vehicles, high-dollar models. And uh, so that's when they started building uh mostly expensive trucks. And uh, so now those expensive trucks are sitting on the lot and uh, manufacturers are no longer short on, on inventory. That has been solved largely. Um, and and uh, consumers are reverting to their, their kind of normal uh, buying patterns. And uh, so it, it's lower lower dollar model. So if you buy a truck, it's, it's no longer the high end. That's now the highest end of the high end. It's now selling. It's, it's the lower part of it. And that's how it used to be. And, and so you see that trend, uh, that, uh, consumers, I think they're still very expensive vehicles, but they're, they're not going for the very high end anymore. Now it's, it's, it's kind of normalized. And, uh, there's a lot of, uh, Pricing pressure coming from electrical vehicles, from EVs, um, on on ICE vehicles. So EVs have cut their prices, and uh, they're now very competitive. And so that's put a lid on new vehicle prices in general. Um, there is just uh, the volume, sales volume is pretty good, and it's up a lot from a year ago. And a year ago, it was up a lot from the prior year. We're still below where we were before the pandemic, but new vehicle sales have sort of it peaked in, in the year 2000, and then it didn't peak again until 2016, and it's right there at the same level in the United States of, of about 17.4 million vehicles per year. And 
And so the, you, you've got this situation where vehicle sales really haven't gone anywhere in, in a couple of decades. And so now we're below that level. I don't know that we'll go back to 17.4 million vehicles a year, uh, given the the dynamics of the vehicle market. Vehicles last longer. People buy fewer of them. Uh, and lots of cities uh, have gotten denser, so people drive less or don't drive at all. They 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 don't need a vehicle, and they they take uh, 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 the Uber to places when they need to go somewhere where they can walk or ride the bicycle too. So this is there's some some structural changes in 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 how city living has adjusted to that. So I think uh, it will be a stretch to imagine that the United States will go back to 17.4 million vehicle sales a year, and those are going to be so what we're selling now is is, is just a little little lower price than the high end during the pandemic. And um, it, you know, I'm still amazed that prices haven't come down further in new vehicles. Uh, there's incentives on them and there's rebates. There's all kinds of things. But, but the CPI for new vehicles has been rather, has been kind of stable for the last year or so. And uh, whereas used vehicles, uh, those prices have come down hard. And on the wholesale side, and they've come down hard on the retail side, and of course, they were ridiculously overpriced. They're still overpriced, but they've come down a bunch. And and uh, I don't know how much longer that will continue, but that's made it a little easier to buy used vehicles now than it was a couple of years ago. Could some of the gritty, over-asking price car dealers be in jeopardy of going under as the economy contracts? Okay, so let me just, just uh, walk into your question here backwards. Okay. Uh, I don't see any contraction in the economy in the United States, so maybe in Canada you're, you're flirting with it. Uh, but um, they're here. There's no contraction. Consumer spending is, is strong. And uh, so we're not seeing that. Vehicle sales are up. They're up in both countries. And um, new vehicle sales. So uh, car dealers see demand. So it's not that. Uh, they they do see competition, pricing pressures, and um, so car dealers are not dumb. And when they see that they cannot sell uh, at these high prices <laughs> with uh, addendum stickers, etc., sooner or later they're going to have to make deals. And and then the addendum stickers vanish, and they've already largely vanished in most places. And uh, and eventually they will have to discount. And it, it manufacturers discounts may be hidden from the consumer, so there may be there may be six thousand uh, uh, dollar discounting or incentives from the manufacturer on this vehicle, and the the dealer may decide uh, to not pass that on. And so you you have those kinds of games being played. And um, but yeah, when they come under volume pressure and competition is there from other dealers on the same franchise, so four dealer versus four dealer, um, uh, those games sooner or later. And, and now there's plenty of inventory. <laughs> the car de- legacy car dealers have inventory out the years, so um, yeah, there's going to be plenty of competition, and there already is plenty of competition. And um, I don't think that uh, smart auto dealers will uh, push themselves out of business by uh, by by asking uh, for for prices over retail sticker and trying to. Insist. I mean, you can you can you can ask for it, but when you insist that that's the price uh, and it's a and it's a Ford that you can buy anywhere, uh, you're not going to make the sale. And uh, that's just a reality now. People can buy this stuff anywhere. They can go to the next Ford dealer, and they may have to drive a little bit, but it's worth the drive. And they should drive. People should shop around. And if somebody, uh, especially if it's a legacy brand, uh, an American brand, um, and you're not getting a big discounts off, off retail pricing, it's time to shop uh, big time. It's time to shop on the Internet, shop in person, um, there, yeah, there, there are lots of full. There's lots of choices out there. Uh, this is the time to to be aggressively shopping around and and not and not get ripped off at some dealer. We keep hearing that electric vehicles are not selling, but EV sales continue to grow year over year. Do you think the growth in EV sales will continue? Yeah, that's it, that, that's what we have. Yeah, EVs are growing, and and obviously the growth rates. Uh, are coming down. They they were triple digits and now they're double digits and 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 so these are still big growth rates. And uh, 
Uh, now EV sales are, are already a significant portion of overall sales and, and they're eating market share of ICE vehicles. Uh, manufacturers have all kinds of problems uh, with volume. I mean, Tesla's trying to crank up volume of its pickup truck, for example, and that's going to be a battle. It's having a huge problem with that. So uh, it's had problems with its other vehicles cranking up volume. Eventually got there. Uh, legacy automakers have the same kinds of problems getting the volume going. And, and so these are the supply chains are just not ready for for volume production and it just takes a long time and there's snafus and things go wrong and these are very complicated manufacturing is a very complicated activity so with worldwide supply chain so it, it it's something that that that's not going to be very smooth um but so far ev sales have grown at substantial rates year over year and uh there's no reason to think that they will slow down anytime Wolf, in Canada, it's been discovered through a freedom of information request that the RCMP has put out a secret report warning governments that over the next five years they should expect perhaps riots in the street once people realize how poor they are. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, if you read the comments in on my website, you know, you get a lot of that. I mean, people are really angry already. And... uh they're really angry about the purchasing power of the income uh, having having dropped so much and over the the last few years and and it, whether it's renting some things or in, in Canada I just uh, wrote about the population growth there and what it does to rents so over the last six months annualized rents in Canada the CPI for rents has spiked by ten percent. Yeah, that's that's gigantic, and um, uh, yeah. So your income uh, loses purchasing power with regards to rent. In prior years, we had the issue of housing, of of purchase home prices. Yeah, so buying a house that that your income lost purchasing power. So home prices spiked, food prices spiked, uh, vehicle prices spiked. All the stuff went up, and and uh, incomes went up a little bit, but not that much. And so uh, th- there is the sense that, yeah, I'll make a little bit more money, but I'm getting poorer and poorer. And um, you can see this anger in my comment section. There are a number of commenters, commenters that, that complain about this all the time. And it's an issue. Uh, people with lots of assets that have come through this uh, <laughs> very nicely so far. Um, but people who uh, work for a living, uh, it's, it's been very tough and um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think riots is, is going to be, uh, the thing, but, uh, you know, policies need to adjust that this inflation needs to be brought under control. Incomes need to match it. And, uh, in Canada and in the United States, to a lesser extent, but also there's a lot of pressure on the labor market from immigration. Uh, you know, that, <laughs> That's an issue because that prevents wages from rising with inflation. And uh, uh, so, yeah, the, these are economic issues that uh, that need to be dealt with. And the way to deal with them, the first step is to bring this inflation under control. And uh, meaning interest rates need to stay high and they don't, they shouldn't be cut. And um, and it, it should make it a lot more, uh, uh, yeah. I should make it a lot harder uh, for prices uh, to go up. You know, when when interest rates rise, what the idea is uh, that uh, you curtail demand just a little bit um, so that the prices have a chance to cool. And um, that's you really need to do that. And it, it's, there's no there's no easy solution out. You know, there's some big economic issues, and the top one is inflation. And um, and it's it's a tough situation to deal with. You can't solve inflation with money printing. Uh, it's going to do the opposite. So uh, money printing solves some of the other problems, but now we've got inflation, and and so um, yeah, th- these are struggles that that we will face over the next few years. Wolf, where's the best place for people to follow you? Wolfstreet.com. It's free. There's no paywall. Uh, business, finance, and money. That's all we do. We don't get into politics, and uh, we have a an angry but well-behaved comment section. Well, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thank you, Chad.
My guest has been Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He was speaking to us from San Francisco. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Martin Armstrong, and Wolf Richter. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from the Director of Marketing for Recyclico, Tony Mitchell. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. My guest is Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for RecycleCo. Tony, welcome back to Company Showcase. Great to be back, Jim. Tony, how are things going with the Taiwan Joint Venture? Well, Jim, by all accounts, uh, things are moving along nicely. Um, our design team just got back from Taiwan, where they were working closely with Zenith's team to go over our plans, you know, tighten up design requirements, measure fitment of on-site equipment, and a whole host of details related to the final specs before nailing down the final plans and commencing the fabrication of our first modular plant here in uh, Vancouver. So it's exciting times for everyone, as this is one of the key milestones we've been all looking forward to checking off our long list of to-dos on the way to commissioning our Taiwan clean spot operations late next year. And, um, you know, it's important for everyone to keep in mind that once we begin operations and switch from being a leading early-stage innovator with a patent process to a real-world business uh, generating significant revenue in a space that will that's ripe for a massive growth, it will be a big wake-up call to the battery industry that there's a new game in town and a major player has stepped up to bat. Is interest also picking up in other areas in Asia? Yeah, Jim, they, it certainly is. Um, while we're still in negotiations with a, you know, a number of large joint venture testing partners around the globe, interest in India in particular is reaching a fever pitch. Um, there's always been an outsized interest in the Recyclico patented process from various parties within India who wish to get into the lithium-ion battery recycling space. And when it comes to the stats, it's easy to see why this is the case. Uh, India has approximately 1.5 billion people, and with 78% of them using mobile devices to access the Internet, this adds up to a lot of lithium-ion batteries. And that's before you take into account the growth of India's EV industry. So when you pair those facts with India traditionally being a hotbed for entrepreneurial innovation and RecycleCo's recently expanded Indian patent portfolio, it's a no-brainer to realize why the interest in our process has become greater than ever before. So we are interacting with a number of interested parties at various stages of development, uh, you know, from startups in the very early phases of planning on up to major players who wish to recoup the capital locked within their battery cathode scrap. They all know we have a highly efficient solution that can be the difference between a not-so-profitable and a highly profitable battery recycling business. And as we've been proving what we can do with battery waste since 2016, they know we're in it for the long haul. So being a leading innovator in the battery recycling space over that span of time must give you a unique perspective. Yes, Jim, it, it certainly does. Um, you know, we're about eight years into the development of the Recyclico patented process, uh, but we're still in the early days of adoption, or put another way, the, you know, the, the fusion of our revolutionary process. Um, you see, the rate of adoption of um, innovative technology and business plans such as ours typically follows a well-established bell curve through five different psychological groups. Um, the first group are the innovators, such as, you know, Zenith and Taiwan, who went through our testing program, did their due diligence, and quickly recognized the value of what we have to offer and wanted to do a deal with us ASAP. Then you have the early adopters. They're highly interested in working together and are motivated to do a deal as well. It just comes down to also doing their due diligence and making the right deal to move forward with. 
Um, from there, you have a steep ramp up with a large early majority who typically wait to see how the innovators and the early adopters are being are doing with the integration of a process before they commit to doing the same. Once they come on the scene, though, it's all hands on deck for rapid growth. Um, but then you have the large late majority who have seen the tide turn, and it's become obvious that a process is making a significant difference to the operations of their fellow battery recyclers and manufacturers and want to look into adopting it themselves. And then lastly, you have the laggards. These are the operations which, for one reason or another, have been locked into doing things a certain way and, you know, finally realize it makes much more sense to do the same as everyone else. The interesting thing from my perspective, Jim, is that um, while the innovators such as Zenith are taking an initial risk, they also stand to reap the largest financial benefit, as they will be set up best to efficiently process cathode scrap the low-hanging fruit of today's battery industry. But when the end-of-life batteries finally reach a large enough volume, the innovators can end up having a massive outsized advantage in experience and financial gain after many years of handling battery waste versus, you know, ladder groups uh, such as the laggards and the late adopters um, who waited to integrate our process into their operations or decided to work with less efficient third-party hub-and-spoke operations. All that said, Our solution of enabling joint venture partners to efficiently recover and reuse their battery materials in-house without sending their valuable waste out to third parties only to buy it back at a multiple of its initial value, you know, it's a a very clear, logical solution to a major problem battery producers and recyclers are dealing with today and will be dealing with well into the future. And for those listening who have been, you know, following and invested in RecycleCo for many years, You'll understand that from what I've outlined, we're still in the very early days of the global diffusion of our innovative lithium-ion battery recycling technology. And I'm truly looking forward to rolling out our modular recycle code clean spots to ultimately become the gold standard in lithium-ion battery recycling around the world. And, uh, Jim, I'm going to include a link to a web page which outlines the, uh, the diffusion of innovation theory. I think some of our listeners will find it pretty interesting. For people new to RecycleCo, where are you traded, and how can they get more information? Well, Jim, we're uh, we're traded on the TSX Venture under the ticker symbol AMY, on the OTCQB under the ticker symbol AMYZF, and on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol ID4. And you can get more information on our website at uh, RecycleCo.com. Tony, thank you so much for the update. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Tony Mitchell, Director of Marketing for RecycleCo. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on March 27th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.